Today I'm going to introduce uh, the frontiers in natural disaster prevention and prediction, mainly the earthquake-induced disasters. I'm Kate from National Taiwan Normal University, and this presentation is for uh, six French Taiwanese frontiers of science in Poussin uh, last month. So first, let's define natural disasters. Natural disasters occur when large numbers of people or economic assets are damaged or destroyed during a natural hazard event. Earthquake, volcano, landslide, flood, cyclone, and drought are six major natural hazards. Earthquake and volcano are classified as geophysical hazards, which they tend to occur along the plate boundaries as denoted by red and black lines um, corresponding to the warm color here. The rest of them are classified as hydrometeorological hazard, which they uh, strongly affect the coastal region, eastern uh, coastal regions of the major continent uh, for cyclone as well as some interior uh, regions of North and South America, Europe and Asia for flood hazard. Whereas uh, drought is more widely dispersed across the semi-arid tropics. Some areas subject to both geophysically and hydrometeorologically driven hazards and these areas uh, fall mainly in East and South Asia, as denoted by the warm color here, and in Central America and in Western South America. And these areas are more densely populated and developed than average, leading to high potential for casualties and economic losses. Based on the World Bank, the report by the World Bank in 2005, the countries most exposed to multiple hazards are listed here. And you see Taiwan as the number one. And uh, I feel more comfortable looking at this version. And what this table says is that 73% um, of Taiwan's land and the population are uh, exposed to more than three natural hazards. And that makes Taiwan one of the places on Earth most vulnerable to natural hazards. But I say we should not limit our awareness of uh, uh, natural hazards by where we live because uh, the human, environmental, and financial impact of natural disasters is actually controlled by how well we prepared for the natural hazard. So in the following slides, I'm going to remind you how many people died in individual natural disaster in the last decades. And you will see that um, the fatalities uh, is not controlled, or well, not ne necessarily controlled by the magnitudes of the natural hazard event. So first, mm. Pakistan flood in two thousand eleven. Um, the fatalities two thousand, but this event affected about twenty million people. Drought in mid-2011 to mid-2012 in East Africa, the fertilities uh, is 100,000, and this event threatened 9.5 million people. Earthquake-induced landslide by the 2008 magnitude 7.9 Wenchuan earthquake in China, and this event triggered over 60 thousand destructive landslides over this huge area 
and cost one over three of the total numbers of fatalities. Twelve thousand. And the cyclone in two thousand eight. Um, Burma, uh, uh, cyclone Nargis. The fatalities uh, goes to uh one hundred and thirty eight thousand. Then the two thousand ten um high tier earthquakes mainly to only seven, but the fatalities goes up to um over two hundred thousand. And this is a so called disasters of engineering because of most of people died due to the building collapse. And then the most destructive um, event in 2004, Magnitude 9.3 uh, Sumatra earthquake. Fatalities uh, is about 300,000, and most of the people died because of the tsunami. So if you pull together the events occur over the past 60 years, what you see from the diagrams here is that over 50% of people died due to the earthquake, tsunami, and the volcano, whereas their uh, event percentage is actually smaller than the cyclone. 29% geophysical hazard, 40% cyclone. So what this says is uh, the geophysical events are less frequent, but potentially more deadly. And unlike a flood, drought, and cyclone, earthquakes actually takes only several to ten seconds to react and respond. And for many years, the scientists have uh, hunted for precursory signals, but it's still impossible to pinpoint exactly where, when, and how big the earthquakes will hit. So what should we do? So here comes the checklist for prevention of uh, natural disasters. You need to understand the generation mechanisms. What kind of physical processes involved? And uh, you want to improve the identification of risk. And you know that the risk is not controlled by the hazard itself, but also the vulnerabilities of a given area. And you want to improve the prevention of losses. Figure out why so many you know, lives lost in the past events and prepare for the next one. So this should go to the short-term preparedness plan. And you want to improve the long-term forecast model by more and more data, by much better model. And uh, most importantly, you need to increase the effectiveness of evacuations and disaster relief. Using earthquake as an example, you know that um, most of the magnitude greater than eight earthquakes occur in a subduction zone. So uh, you need to know where the stress highly accumulated and why. And to identify risk, at least you need to map out uh, active faults, the spot for liquefaction and where we expect the uh, uh, building collapse and so on. And the prevention of losses for the short-term plan, short-term uh, preparedness goes to earthquake early warning, and the long-term forecast model goes to seismic hazard map. And the earthquake evacuation plans um, in different buildings, public area, uh, should be figured out. So in the following slides, I'm going to introduce the frontiers in short-term um, preparedness, the current status of earthquake early warning since then.
and、um, I will also introduce a stories of、uh, high tsunami risk in Indonesia and the corresponding、uh, evacuation plan. Earthquake early warning system is a detection system that can sound the alarm and the moments before a big shaking arrives. And so that you have enough time to lower and stop public transportations and save some lives. And the idea is,、uh, small earthquakes behave differently、uh, with、uh, large earthquakes, and so that they look also differently. As you can see from this、uh, figure, that. Small earthquakes, blue; larger earthquake, red. And you can tell that、uh, small earthquakes tend to have、uh, higher frequency, smaller amplitude, and larger earthquakes higher amplitude and、uh, lower frequency. And the reason for this to happen is because bigger earthquakes rupture larger areas of the fault with more slip. So that the P waves is larger in amplitude and lower in frequency. So based on this difference,、uh, you can you can tell is this gonna to be big one、um, based on a threshold in amplitude and frequency. So that you can issue a alarm before the big shaking arrives. For example, in nineteen eighty nine, Loma Prieta earthquake occurred here. Ah,、uh, its magnitude six point nine earthquake. After the ground started to shake, it took um about thirty seconds for damaging vibrations to travel, a one hundred kilometers to San Francisco and Oakland, where you have over eighty percent of the fatalities. And here shows the、uh, um, damage to the Bay Bridge. And the reason you have such uh, uh, serious、um, damage in this faraway area is due to the special、um, near surface geological condition, as shown by this figure. That you have the soft mud in this area, so that、uh, the seismic signal got amplified. As shown by this higher amplitude signal here, so that、uh, gives you、uh, stronger shaking at the times of earthquake. So, if a early warning system had existed back then, it could have provided at least a twenty second warning to save some lives. Such earthquake early warning systems. Have been deployed all over the world,、um, especially in an area with higher earthquake hazard, as denoted by the gray circle here. This is、uh, where you have、uh, early warning system on already. But there is a blind zone shown by uh, this uh, dashed circle. That、uh, no warning can be provided, which you need onsite warning, and that is、um, if you have the device with modern mass sensor, which is a accelerometer,、uh, that install in your home and school, that can provide warning within three seconds after P arrivals, and this system called P alert, deployed by Yi Ming Wu, from National Taiwan University. That provides.、Uh, well, this system works pretty well in Taiwan, and so far we have、uh, over two hundred P alert stations installed in Taiwan. And parallel to early warning system, citizen science is getting popular and highly encouraged. And the idea is that、uh, you have the volunteers, which is the citizen scientists. To、um, report back the first-hand information of earthquakes within minutes, 
and you can help them to host seismic stations to provide、uh, detailed waveform recordings, as shown by this figure that you have the、uh, more detailed information of ground motion up or down, and that helps a lot. And the understandings of earthquake source processes and seismic wave propagation, especially in the area where you don't have dense enough seismic network. And even better, you can also have the online educational tools that allow the citizen scientists to、uh, see their data, process their data, and interact with other people's data, and perhaps contribute to scientific discovery. And in the following slides, I'm gonna talk about high tsunami risk in West. Sumatra, Indonesia. You already saw the pictures of the two thousand four magnitude nine point three Sumatra earthquake that killed about three hundred thousand people, right? And actually, after that event, several more great earthquake, which is magnitude greater than eight, ah,、uh, hit the same area, line up along the strikes of the trench. So what happened here is, after the two thousand four magnitude nine point three earthquake that ruptured this area, you have、uh, several more earthquakes occur in two thousand five, two thousand seven, and two thousand eight, and even before the Sumatra earthquake, you have the smaller earthquake occur along the same plate boundary in two thousand and two thousand two, and you can see. A clear seismic gap here, and so was in this seismicity map. So the question is: Is this the place where you don't get accu to accumulate stress,、uh, so that you don't need to worry about the、uh, future earthquake potential in this area, Padan? And the answer is no, because by looking at this、uh, historical earthquake. That occurred in last two hundred years. You see that、um, there was a big enough earthquake occur in Padang area in seventeen ninety seven. So what this says is by calculation, a magnitude eight point eight earthquake is expected to fill that gap to occur in Padang. Indonesia, and this is the area where you have a million people lived here. And unfortunately,、um, the highest population is far from the high dam. The calculation based on assumed earthquake location and wave propagation speed. Says that a tsunami will hit the coast in twenty five minutes after the earthquake occurred. And this figure shows the modeled inundation area, as denoted by blue. Here, corresponding to a、uh, evacuation time map, showing by different colors here. And this、uh, says、uh, that if you live in this red area, you need to have forty、uh, minutes to run to the safer area, higher land. And by comparing with this twenty-five minutes, and you know that if you live here in a red area, you just don't have enough time to run. So the mayor and the emergency agency in Padang says that if the anticipated earthquake and tsunami occurred today, four hundred thousand people would die, and that means、um, there is a urgent need for people living there to prepare themselves. So the nonprofit. Organization, Geohazards International, they push up、uh, the tsunami evacuation plan in this area by learning from Japanese experience.
as shown by this figure, that the high ground actually allows people to stay uh, during the tsunami, and that um, saved a lot of lives in a historical tsunami event in Japan. So a tsunami evacuation park is planned, as shown here, uh, which is uh, near the coast. That allows uh, capacities of uh, 20,000 people at the tides of tsunami. However, comparing with the 400,000 uh, possible uh, death toll, it's only you, you only save like 5% so people and that means even the high risk area is well identified but there are a lot of, of works to do I want to end uh, this presentation by this, this slide there are four aspects to natural disaster risk reduction before the hazard event you have a long-term mitigation and a short-term preparedness to do. And after the event, you have the response and recovery to work on. And what a scientist can do is to the screen area mitigation part that they can help to identify risk uh, that are not well uh, recognized yet and uh, to detect vulnerable spots and hunt for precursory signals. And also the um, yellow area, um, they can help uh, for the short-term preparedness, including real-time monitoring and the better early warning system. And if you place any natural hazard into the center of the circle that will work and but remember that in during this talk, I didn't mention anything about the climate change associated uh, natural hazard. But like it or not, uh, they are getting worse and worse. So important thing is that uh, we cannot wait until government to make effort on the disaster, uh, a special disaster response. And we need to prepare ourselves and the cities uh, to face the um, possible natural disaster happening in the near future.